Good morning. Good morning. My name is uh, Dr. Howard Robinson. I'm the Master of Ceremony, Archivist at Alabama State University. And I'd like to, to call up Dr. Franklin to provide our, well, actually, Dr. Um, Reverend Gretz, I'm sorry. Reverend Gretz is going to provide our invocation. Reverend Gretz. Dr. Franklin would have been quite capable. <laughs> I know her to be a person of faith, and I don't doubt that she's able to pray. <laughs> Let's bow our heads. Lord God of the universe, you have created all that exists and put things into order as you chose. You who have given us responsibilities, not only for our own lives, but for the lives of those around us to whom we relate in a variety of ways. Right now we think about ourselves as part of a mighty nation, an important nation in this world, and yet a nation which is struggling, not only because of problems dividing us from one another, but also dealing with problems facing us because of weather, weather matters that are way beyond our control. We thank you, Lord, that you have called us to be your people. You have given us the ability to share responsibilities with each other. You have given us opportunities to align ourselves with others who are like-minded so that we may truly rule as you would have us rule. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of voting, for the privilege of speaking out our desires for our country and our communities. We thank you, Lord, that you will guide us as we face this test next Tuesday, that you will give us, heart, give us hearts that are prepared to reach out to you for guidance. Bless us in this program today as we reflect on that gift of being able to share our concerns and share our own, own opinions and our thoughts about our government. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. honor to follow you as well. I appreciate the prayer for us. To President-elect Silver, Executive Vice President Nye, members of our audience, and the honorable members of our panel, we bring you greetings today on behalf of the National Center for the Study of Civil Rights and African American Culture, whose mission is to serve as a living museum, a research center, a repository for information relative to the Lord's Civil Rights Movement, the history of Montgomery, and the history and culture of African Americans. We have a special emphasis as well on Alabama State University's role in the Lord's Civil Rights Movement. Today, as we approach the 2012 election, the National Center is happy to present a program that is both historic and urgent as we seek to understand the movement for voting rights at a time in which these basic rights in a democratic society are being challenged. The National Center feels an imperative to teach this rich history through the presentations of our own ASU icons, foot soldiers, and civil rights champions who have sacrificed so much for voting rights in Alabama. We want to thank our moderator, Dr. Knight, and our panelists for being with us today. And we say thanks for their years of public service to advance the cause of nonviolent social change. I would also like to welcome and thank all of you who are here with us today, members of the community, <coughs> students, faculty, and staff. In the visionary words of Dr. King at a meeting of the MIA at the time of the Montgomery bus boycott, he stated that the chief weapon now fight for civil rights is the vote. He envisioned a day that the Negro vote would become the decisive vote in national elections. According to the prophetic words of Dr. King, 
We can never be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote and a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. With this mandate and heritage, the National Center welcomes you to our program today. Thank you. Looking at um, today's program, um, the leadership at the National Center thought about um, it, its mandate, its mandate to, to discuss, to investigate, to celebrate the modern civil rights movement. And we think about the civil rights movement, really, this is a movement to secure the rights of, really, for African American citizens. And when we talk about rights, what are we talking about? In, in reference to the civil rights movement, we're talking about um, constitutional rights. Those rights codified, particularly in the first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights. <clears throat> now, in, in, a, in a, representative, a representative democracy or a representative republic, it's critical that individuals have the authority or the ability to elect their individuals who represent their interests. And these individuals usually aggregate in deliberative bodies and to ensure that your interests are taken into consideration when public policy is decided, it's critical that individuals participate in the electoral process. Now, this system is prob was problematic, problematic in the United States in that um, the United States allowed a system that disenfranchised persons of African descent. So black citizens could not elect, particularly throughout the South, prior to the, to, the, to the 1960s, could not elect individuals to represent their interests. So in many cases, elected officials often ignored the, the interest of African Americans. Okay, consequently, many of the civil rights activists targeted the American government <coughs> to redress this particular grievance. And so we see as one of the clear First Amendment rights, the protection of, of freedom of speech, the right for people to peaceably assemble and petition the government for redress of grievances. And we see this clearly throughout the civil rights movement. What are those issues that, that permeated the civil rights movement, that defined and animated the civil rights movement? Equal treatment under the law, equal protection from state-supported and extra-legal violence, equal access to public accommodations, fair and equitable treatment in hiring practices, fair and equitable distribution of public services and resources. And we see right here in Montgomery how civil rights activists and organizations forwarded those aims. The Montgomery Improvement Association worked to ensure the treatment under law of, of individuals, particularly of the Montgomery Improvement Association and the NAACP, took up the case of Jeremiah Reeves who was a Booker T. Washington student accused of rape in 1952 and was electrocuted in 1958. The, the, the NAACP and the MIA wanted to ensure that the Fifth Amendment was, was followed and that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or, or property without due process of law. And so they questioned that due process system. The Sixth Amendment. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy trial, and a public trial, and an impartial jury. And so the NAACP and the MIA challenged this concept of an impartial jury. The MIA coordinated the Montgomery bus boycott. <clears throat> and Alabama State students sat in at the Montgomery County Courthouse, all to ensure equal access to public accommodations. Edie Nixon and his leadership of the NAACP and other local activists complained with the city of Montgomery and the state of Alabama and hundreds of private entities employed African Americans in only menial positions. In the mid 20th century, the WPC, the Women's Political Council, among uh, Alabama state-based political organization, addressed conditions in black neighborhoods where streets were typically unpaid, where few recreational outlets were available to black children and where police routinely brutalized um, black citizens. All of these were issues that were fought for in, during the modern civil rights movement. Now, this issue of voting rights was an issue took, taken up early in the modern civil rights movement. The NAACP is clearly at the forefront. 
1944 with the Smith versus Allwright case that over, overturns or outlaws white primaries. SNCC in 1961 debates direct action ver versus voter registration. And actually, the organization bifurcates. There's two entities under one umbrella, one pursuing political activism and voting rights, and the other pursuing direct action and, and attack and segregation. <clears throat> so the Voting Rights March and the Voting Rights Campaign in 1965 is an outgrowth of both the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and Martin Luther King and SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, coming together to, to forward the aims of voting rights. And so what we see here is in Montgomery, we're, we're probably in a very unique place because we could have a discussion that looks at the nexus or the connection between the modern civil rights movement and electoral politics in a way that very few places around this nation can do. Right? So the people that we have on this panel <coughs> participated in the modern civil rights movement. And they pursued civil rights agendas into electoral politics. I just want to mention before we move on, just a few people, both locally and nationally, Fred Gray of the MIA, after losing a race in 1966 for the state legislature, was elected, elected to the House of Representatives in 1970. Andrew Young of the SCLC was elected to Congress in 1970. Edie Nixon of the MIA ran a close but unsuccessful race for the Montgomery County Democratic Committee in 1954, and then again for the Alabama House of Representatives in 1974. Bobby Rush, a black Panther, first ran unsuccessfully in 1974, then was elected to the Chicago City Council in 1983 and a Congress in 1994. Marion Barrett, John Lewis, and the list goes on, of those civil rights activists who participated in the modern civil rights movement and then made that transition to electoral politics. To, to, to provide some context for today's discussion, I'd like to, to play a short clip by one of our panelists who, who seems to be running a little late today. But, have no fear. <laughs> we have, um, I, I think, I, 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 it's really important that I, that I say this, in that we, we conduct oral histories at, at Alabama State and in the library and in the archives. And these oral histories allow, allow us to sort of chronicle um, the experiences of, of, of black people in general, but people in various endeavors. And so, um, Alvin Holmes, Representative Alvin Holmes, Alvin Holmes was, was gracious enough to sit down and do an oral history. And really, you could see how clearly this program sort of emanates out of the, the thinking and the experiences uh, of Alvin Holmes. The, uh, there was a thin line between uh, uh, civil rights and politics. Well, that after uh, they passed the 1965 Voter Rights Act and they sent uh, federal registrars in to uh, get blacks registered to vote. And, and uh, we had a lot of black registered voters and uh, enough to elect uh, blacks to uh, office in uh, certain locations uh, throughout the South and Southern states. Well, at that time, most of the people who ran for office uh, were those who had been involved in the civil rights movement, actively involved in the civil rights movement. And we didn't look at it uh, as being a political figure. Uh, we looked at it, you, you still were a, a civil rights figure, and you get running for public office in order to give you a better platform uh, to, to, to fight for civil rights. And just as I tell people now, you know, I don't uh, consider myself a politician. I mostly consider myself a civil rights activist. Uh, most issues that people read about me in public are not uh, political issues, it's, it's, it's civil rights issues. And so, as a result, you had, you know, uh, uh, Andrew Young running, uh, you know, from mayor. You had, uh, you know, uh, Mary Bear, you know, ran for Washington, D.C. You had uh, a lot of local people, you know, run for city council, and, and, and a lot of blacks ran for the state legislature. Um, there were some blacks who got elected, you know, who had never participated in the civil rights movement, you know, because 
the uh, you know the opportunity was available for them. We're gonna if there's another clip to this that if we have time at the end of the program I'd like you to hear. But right now we're gonna turn the, the I'm gonna turn the microphone over to um, Representative John Knight and he's gonna to engage our panel in a discussion. Um, he has a series of questions. And, and hopefully this, this exchange will illuminate the, the, the nexus, their civil rights experience and the connection between the civil rights movement and their electoral politics. Can you hear me? Do I need a mic? I need a mic. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. I'm delighted to have been asked to participate in this panel discussion this morning. And I must admit uh, from the outset, I feel a little inadequate sitting up here with uh, legends like uh, Mr. Boone, the Reverend Gratz, and others, Mr. Herman Harris, and others that I see in the audience uh, because you were so actively involved in the total civil rights movement and the many things that took place. But I want to express my appreciation to Dr. Franklin, uh, Dr. Robertson, uh, to President Silver, and all involved for allowing a forum such as this to take place on the campus of Alabama State University. Because there were times, as many of you remember, to even a whole discussion, there were presidents and there were faculty members that were afraid to do that for fear of losing their jobs or for fear that uh, there would be some retaliation. So uh, we've come a long way. And I say this all the time. Having been born and raised here in Montgomery, Alabama, right here on Hall Street, a bit of you know that. Uh, when I say born, I was born on Lake Street, Hales Infirmary. Uh, somebody go look that up and then you'll know exactly what that was. <laughs> so I feel blessed myself. I feel blessed as a young kid. I can recall being on Hall Street and dad having to tell us, go get on the bed because the Klan's marching down Hall Street. I recall waking up early one morning in Sheridan Heights and a cross burning in my yard, and some of you can remember that as well. Uh, I can recall Dr. Boone participating in several marches when uh, they had plotted to, uh, to blow uh, a, a bridge up uh, of where we were marching. I, we always thank the Southern Poverty Law Center and at that time, I think it was uh, Attorney General Jimmy Evans who caught the individuals that uh, were planning that and also caught the individuals that burned the cross in my yard. Uh, so, and having been born on Hall Street, uh, I can recall Oak Park, which was a public facility uh, that uh, as kids, we could not even play in Oak Park. Now, let's transition and move forward. I never imagined during those times that I would be one of the first blacks elected to the Montgomery County Commission and serve there for 12 years, along with uh, Frank Bray, and I think most of you remember that. Those were telling points here in Montgomery because we've been through so much as it relates to voter participation and the lack thereof. Uh, there have been so many struggles that's taken place, and I stand on the shoulder and people on this panel as well as others that paved the way and lost their lives so that we would have the freedoms that we uh, have here today. And when you talk about the education region, Marina, and I may ramble a little bit because it's just so much. You can sit here and talk all day about what took place. Years ago, when the president of Alabama State and the president of A&M would go to the Alabama legislature to get their state appropriation, you know, they had to wait on the outside until the other schools got their appropriation. And then they'd call them in one by one and say, uh, President uh, from Alabama State, President from a and uh, this is what's left and this is what you'll get for your institution. Well, once we got the voting rights passed and we got blacks elected to the legislature, that's no longer the case. Uh, and I'm proud to say that uh, we have worked together in this state to make certain that Alabama State and a &M got at least their proportionate share in many cases. In many cases, we've tried to make up for the wrongs, and that's, uh, that was part of the Knight v. Alabama case, and it'll be a different forum for that, uh, but that was one of the uh, things that we thought uh, that was extremely important. 
One reason that I was personally involved in it because I attended Booker T. Washington High School right here in Montgomery. When it came time to integrate, uh, the solution was to close the high school and that uh, the students would go to the white right, and not to the black. Not bring whites to the black schools, but take the blacks out and send them to the white school. Seeing that on the horizon when it came to higher education, that made me emphatic about the role that I played in the Knight the Alabama case. But we're delighted to have uh, the panel that's here today. Uh, Reverend Richard Boone has always been an icon in the civil rights movement. Uh, he, I mean, he is a foot soldier. Uh, hadn't looked for salt, publicity, or anything of that nature, but just did what he thought was right. And uh, I think the question that they wanted me to pose to you initially would be, how did you become involved in the civil rights movement and give us some type of analysis of that? Thank you, uh, Representative Knight, my leader, my story of being involved in the movement uh, happened. I happened to be in uh, a place called Fairbanks, Alaska. And I saw <coughs> the bus boycott news about the bus boycott, and it made me angry. And this was in the uh, late 50s. And I made a, I, made, I said a prayer, and made a promise that when I got out of the service, that one of the first things I was going to do was buy me a motorbike, uh, AK-47, <laughs> and go around killing me, white folk. That, that was where I was. And uh, after I got out, instead of getting the bike and the rifle, I ran into uh, Reverend uh, James Luther Bettler, uh, you know, Ivan Ho Donaldson, uh, Jim Foreman, right? I could call names, and they buttonholed me and took me to a place in Georgia, McIntosh, Georgia, and uh, taught me another way right. to resolve the problem. And some of my teachers dropped out on the way but I'm still holding the bloodstained banner. Right. Yeah. I wouldn't kill a flea. <laughs> but I got involved and in I got tired of uh, going downstairs in Cressus mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, you know, eating at the back. Uh, although when, uh, when, when, the, when we got integrated food, uh, I let the other folks go on and eat. I couldn't eat it uh, because uh, I was afraid that I might get poisoned. So I, I, I kind of let some other people go. So I, I, I mean, because the Lord said, I want you to do uh, penance for what you've thought in your mind because the scripture tells us thou shalt not kill. So I'm still doing that now. Yeah. And, and that's the way I got involved. And believe it or not, it was 1958 when I got involved with SCLC. And uh, I was arrested for the first time in 58 uh, in Carolina. Uh, uh, and so I, you know, I stayed around. And I'm not going to be a slave of uh, Dr. Robinson. I said, before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave. Go home to the Lord and be free. And the people here in Alabama, George Wallace said, before I free a slave, I'll bury him in his grave. <laughs> and so I said, okay. So the first movement we got started here in Alabama was the Grove Movement. And that means get rid of Wallace. So we started out to do it. 
Well, she was the kind of the icon for the people over on the other side. So it was a, a pleasant experience after I learned the truth. And the truth is that I needed all of those brothers to bring us to where we are now. Never thought that I'd get this far. I gave myself till age 30 and I'd be dead. I'm 31 now. <laughs> thank you, very, thank you very much, Reverend Bo. And, and I mean, so many people have similar stories uh, to tell, and I know that we could be here all morning and afternoon as well as to the evening to talk about the experiences uh, as it relates to the voting rights and things of that nature. But another person that's also been very instrumental in is Representative McClammy, and I started working with Representative McClammy. Well, probably right after college, and I have never seen a person as visionary. A person who always has a new way of doing something, an idea of how to create something. Now, in most cases, he bring little money to the table. He bring <laughs> ideas. <laughs> and, and, and one thing I had to repeat to him over and over again, a quote that I got from David Brunham when I uh, had an idea to him, he said, ideas without money remain ideas. So, <laughs> But, uh, but he has been involved for a long time, uh, working with him when he was president of Trinidad Technical College. Uh, he's responsible for so much that has taken place in this city, uh, especially when it comes to economic development. Uh, I pride myself on being involved in many economic development projects, but he's been on the forefront as well. I know many things that's taken place that he's carried to the Chamber of Commerce, to the mayors of the city, and throughout. So at this time, we'll let him give you a brief on how he got started or anything that he'd like to say relative to the role that he plays. Let me say this. One thing that in Montgomery that we have been able to do is this. And it was a planned strategy. We decided that you didn't have enough black elected officials to be everything to everybody. That there were certain one of us that would focus on certain areas and try to develop certain types of expertise to make certain that we're maximizing our efforts uh, and the voting rights efforts to serve the people that we represent. Some of us took on economic development issues. Some said, I'm going to do nothing but civil rights. Some said that we will work in education. So we had to do that because many cases as elected officials, you don't have staff, you don't have uh, the, the wherewithal as well as uh, the resources to do many things. So you had to kind of focus, and we have been able to do that ever since, even since the time I was on the county commission. Uh, Frank Bray and I had that type of working relationship. He wanted to be the diplomat, and I had to be the flamethrower. Uh, <laughs> but it worked, it worked because uh, I remember in Montgomery County, we got the first holiday for Martin Luther King when we got elected to the Montgomery County Commission. And we had to hold up the commission all day long. And I was out there reading a book for Martin Luther King, and he was back meeting with the other commissioners before we got the vote to go ahead and, and, and call it, make it a holiday. And that was the first holiday in Montgomery County, and it was declared by the Montgomery County Commission. And we had uh, uh, one of the Republican elected commissioners to go along with us and, uh, for that uh, uh, to pass. But this time, Representative Thad McClellan coming his own way. Thank you. First of all, I'm not a native of Montgomery. I came here as a student, and uh, really came as a transfer student. And so I got started really in the classroom. And the first person was Mrs. Portia Trim. <laughs> she, uh, when I came, uh, Dr. Trim was no longer president. He was kind of like, I think Dr. Hatch came after him, and then Dr. Watkins came in. And, so at the time that I came in student, I was in her class, and I was one of the few students that had a car. And uh, she was having to move out of the uh, president's house over on Jackson Street before I was Griffin. And so, uh, so I, uh, you know, when you get out of class, get out of school, you the uh, first lady, move. And then at the same time, I was in another class with a person that was involved in a couple of the references that Dr. Boone has, has made, and that was Attorney Charles Conner. He was a business law instructor. And um, 
he was kind of some careless residuals from some of those earlier cases, particularly the Jeremiah Reeves case. The American Civil Liberties Union, which was the, was the other partner with SCLC and SNCC, was the American Civil Liberties Union.